Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. To the news report about a robbery and then complete the notes from the detective's notebook. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. There has been an armed robbery this morning at the Halifax Building Society's branch in Edward Street. John Brings is at the scene with Detective Sergeant Henry Lawson. Detective Sergeant, can you tell us what you know about the robbery? Yes, the raid took place this morning, shortly after 11.30, when a man accompanied by a woman went into the offices of the uh, building society and asked to see the manager. Uh, there were no other customers in the building at the time. They were let into the manager's office and the woman produced a gun from her handbag. Then they took the manager back out of his office and made him tell the cashiers to hand over all the money they had in the tills and in the safe. Uh, it came to about $25,000. Presumably you have a number of witnesses. Yes, uh, we have a good description of both of them. Uh, the man was about 1 meter 80 centimeters, around 35 years of age, with blue eyes and short curly red or ginger hair. He was wearing jeans, a green sweater and a three-quarter length blue coat. When he spoke to the cashier when he came in, he called himself Mr. Erickson, but we doubt whether that is his real name. But we do know that may be his real name. He also spoke with a strong Scottish accent, which may help us to trace him. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And what about the woman? Now, she is in her early 20s, slim and quite tall, about 1 meter 70 centimeters. She was wearing a long white raincoat, which was quite loose-fitting, and which she didn't take off. She had a beige handbag which they used to hide the gun in. She's got straight, shoulder-length blonde hair, blue eyes, and, like the man, has a noticeable accent. Do you have any other information? Yes, the car they used was seen by two or three people. It's a blue or dark blue Ford Escort, and we have the registration number. And it's G595ERI. I'll say that again. It's G595ERI. Now, the car was stolen from Bishopstone just over a week ago, so if anyone has seen it in the last week, we would like to hear from them. We also know that the car's front left headlight was broken when it was stolen, and is still broken, we think. So, you would like information from the public about the car? Yes, and the people. We're appealing to anyone who thinks they may recognize the two robbers or know anything about the car. We've set up an incident room in Swindon and the telephone number is 774529. So we would like people to ring us if they have any information. 
and of course, all calls will be dealt with in the strictest confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the number again, if you have any information, is double seven four five two nine. And now back to the studio. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this short talk on the subject of fireworks. Now, fireworks, as I'm sure many of you know, were invented in China, though there has long been disagreement as to exactly when, or even in which century. The consensus nowadays, though, is that it was in the 6th, as there is considerable evidence of war rockets being made then. We also know that fireworks were in use by the 7th century in Arabia, where they were called Chinese arrows, reflecting their military potential. It then took a long time for them to spread to Europe. In fact, it wasn't until the 1200s that fireworks made their appearance there. The basic ingredients of fireworks have changed little to this day. Their explosive capacity comes mainly from black powder, also known as gunpowder, which is produced from a mixture of charcoal, sulphur and potassium nitrate. A modern aerial firework, the kind used nowadays in big public displays, not the small rocket type that you might remember from your childhood, is normally made in the form of a shell often a sphere about the size of a peach. Inside the shell are a number of stars surrounded by black powder and running through the centre of the round shell is a charge that makes the firework explode when it reaches the desired altitude. This is known as the bursting charge. When this explodes, it ignites the outside of the stars which begin to burn with bright showers of sparks. Since the explosion throws the stars in all directions, you get the huge sphere of sparkling light that is so familiar at firework displays. A shell of this kind is launched from a 75mm diameter mortar, which in some ways resembles the type used by the military. The mortar is a steel, or increasingly for safety reasons, shatterproof plastic pipe. This is likely to be 500 millimetres long and sealed at one end. The other end is aimed at the sky and at the bottom of the pipe, below the shell, is placed a cylinder containing black powder. This has a long fuse which projects out of the tube. When this is lit, it quickly burns down to the lifting charge which explodes to launch the shell. In so doing, it also lights the shell's fuse. The shell's fuse burns while the shell rises to its correct altitude and then ignites the bursting charge so it explodes. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. More complicated shells are divided into sections and burst in two or three phases. Shells like this are called multi-break shells. They may contain stars of different colours and compositions to create softer or brighter light, more or less sparks, etc. Some shells contain explosives designed to crackle in the sky, or whistles that explode outward with the stars. The sections of a multi-break shell are ignited by different fuses, and the bursting of one section ignites the next. The shells must be assembled in such a way that each section explodes in sequence to produce a distinct, separate effect. The pattern that an aerial shell paints in the sky depends on the arrangement of stars inside the shell. For example, if the stars are equally spaced in a circle, with black powder inside the circle, you will see an aerial display of smaller star explosions equally spaced in a circle. To create a specific figure in the sky, for instance a heart shape, you create an outline of the figure in stars inside the shell. Then you place explosive charges inside those stars to blow them outward into the shape of a large heart. Each charge has to be ignited at exactly the right time, or the whole thing is spoiled. Many other shapes have particular names, like the willow. This is formed by stars that fall in the shape of willow tree branches, spreading a little to the side and then downwards. The high charcoal composition of the stars makes them long burning, so they may even stay visible until they hit the ground. The ring shell is fairly basic, it is produced by stars exploding outwards to produce a symmetrical ring of coloured lights. More complex is the pattern created by the palm, which contains large comets, or charges, in the shape of a solid cylinder. These travel outwards, explode and then curve downwards, like the limbs of a palm tree. The serpentine, the last one for now, is different again. When this one bursts, it sends small tubes of incendiaries scattering outwards in random paths, which may culminate in exploding stars. It can be quite spectacular. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two geography students, Jack and Katie, talking about a field trip to Kenya in Africa. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Katie, hi. Thanks for inviting me round. Oh, thanks for coming. I know you're up to your neck in finals revision, but I've got to make up my mind about next year's geography field trip, and I'd really like your advice. We've got to choose between an African trip and one in Europe. They've told us a bit about both trips in the lecture, but I really can't make up my mind, and I know you did the African one last year. That's right. So, where exactly did you go? I mean, I know it was in Kenya, in East Africa. Yes. Well, we were right up in the northwest of the country. It was beautiful. We stayed in a place called the Marich Pass Field Studies Centre. Right. 
Dr. Rowe said the accommodation was traditional African-style cottages. Uh, he had a special name for them. Bandas. Yes, they're fine. You have to share two or three people together. They're pretty basic, but you have a mosquito net. They don't provide spray, though, so remember to take plenty with you. You'll need it. <laughs> and there's no electricity in the field centre. You'll have hurricane lamps instead. They give a good light. It's no problem. What about places to study? Dr. Rowe said there was a library? Yes, but it's quite small. There's a lecture room as well, but most of us worked out in the open air. There are plenty of places outside, and it's so beautiful. You're right in the middle of the forest clearing. I gather it's a relatively unmodernized area. Definitely. They actually set up the centre there because it's on the boundaries of two distinct ecological zones. The mountains, where the people are mainly agriculturalists, and the semi-arid plains lower down, where they're semi-nomadic pastoralists. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So how much chance did you get to meet the local people there? Did you get the chance to do interviews? Yes, though we had to use local interpreters, but that was okay. Then we did field observation, of course, looking at environmental and cultural conditions and morphological mapping. What's that? Oh, looking at the surface forms of the landscape, the slope elements and so on. What about specific projects? Yes. After the first two or three days, we spent most of our time on those. We could pretty well do what we wanted, although they all had to relate to issues concerned with development in some way. People did various things. Some were based on social and cultural topics, like the effect of education on the aspirations of young people. And some did more physical process-based studies, looking at things like soil erosion. My group actually looked at issues relating to water, things like sources such as rivers and wells, and quality and so on. It was a good project to work on, but a bit frustrating. We felt we needed a lot more time, really. Right. Dr. Rowe did say something about limiting project scope. Yes, he told us that too at the beginning, and I can see why now. What else? Well, we had some good trips out as part of the course. We went to a market town, a place called Sigur, that was to study distribution. And to look at agricultural production, we went to the Weiwei Valley. That's an important agricultural region. And what about animals? Did you have a chance to go to a national park? Sure. We did a trip on the last day, on the way back to the airport at Nairobi. But actually, there was lots of wildlife at the field centre. Vervet monkeys and baboons and lizards. Mm, it does sound good. It was excellent, I'd say. In terms of logistics, it was very well run. But it was more than that. I mean, it's not the sort of place I'd ever have got to on my own. And it was a real eye-opener. It got me really interested in development issues and the way other people live. I did find it frustrating at the time that we couldn't get as far as we wanted on the project... But actually, I'm going to follow it up in my dissertation. So it's given me some ideas and data for that as well. So you'd say it was worth the extra money? Definitely. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4 
you are going to hear a lecture about dorm rooms. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to your new home for the upcoming year. These dorm rooms are among the best in the nation and are the newest ones at this school. So I hope you will all learn to appreciate them and take good care of all the facilities here. I am Gina, and I will be residential advisor in this building for the year. Today I am going to tell you about some of the programs and facilities that are available to you. I will also be telling you the rules that everyone is expected to abide by. I will be asking you to give me your full attention for the next few minutes. I will first tell you about the facilities that are available to you. The dining facility is located on the first floor of the building. It is open seven days a week from 7 a.m. to midnight. All the food offered to students is freshly made every day, and my own opinion is that the food is actually quite good. Feel free to come and grab a banana for breakfast or sit down with a group of friends for dinner. Although your meals are served buffet style, please do not waste food. All students are expected to clean their own tables after meals. In the basement of this building, there is a gym and recreational hall. The gym has workout equipment such as treadmills and weight sets. In the recreational hall, there are ping pong tables and a pool table for student use. You must sign in when using this equipment and you will be held responsible for any damages or losses. The gym and recreational hall are open daily from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. There is a kitchen located on the second floor of this building. Your dorm key will open this door. Inside, there is a refrigerator, a microwave, an oven, and a stove. This room is open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. If you decide to cook a meal, please be considerate to all the students and clean up after yourself. You can use some food in here, but please do not make a mess. Some students do end up having their food eaten from the fridge, so be careful. Don't leave anything that looks like it tastes really good. Do not leave pots and pans lying around in the kitchen. Please store these in your room. There are many programs being sponsored by our building this year. One of the most popular is our Saturday morning outings. In the past years, these trips have included going fishing, hiking, cycling, ice skating, and even going to the beach. There will be a listing of schedule events coming out soon. The university sponsors these trips, so transportation will be provided. However, there are usually some costs associated, though they are usually minimal. Our building also has a volleyball team. All students who live in this building are welcome to join. Last year we won first place in the dorm league. Please sign up at the front desk if you are interested as soon as possible, as there are only 20 spaces available, based on a first-come, first-serve rule. The last things I want to talk about are the rules of our building. I know rules can be boring, but they are necessary to ensure the welfare of everyone living here. First, noise levels must be kept to a minimum after 11 p.m. Many students have early classes, so for those of you that have the luxury of sleeping until 10, please don't stay up late making lots of noise. Secondly, all visitors must sign in at the front door. Even if you have friends that are regular visitors, they must still always sign in. This rule is to prevent theft and robbery from occurring. Thirdly, alcohol and drugs are not permitted in this dorm in any place or at any time. Lastly, just be safe and have a great time. University is the greatest time of your life, so make the most of it. Thank you all for your attention. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.